Um, so I'm Matt Gaffney, also known as Gaffers. Uh, I'm a principal engineer at United Airlines. Um, I'm also a, a village lead at the Aerospace Village. Um, so a big shout out to those guys, put on a great show this year. Um, I'm going to do a shallow dive into Aircraft PKI, and I've got a few caveats to start with. Like I said, this is a shallow dive into the topic. Um, I see a few operators uh, that I recognize in the room, and at least one expert uh, who will know this topic several times better than I ever will. Um, and you'll understand when I say this, this is something you can easily spend three days talking about. It is so complex. Um, so there are some simplifications and there are some generalizations. And I'm also only going to speak to what I'm authorized to speak to. And um, through the village, our ethos is to bring light and not heat to the topic of cyber and aerospace. So this will be supplier agnostic, and there are some industry challenges that we're working together to fix, which I cannot cover. All right? Um, that's what we'll go through today. Um, the importance, some use cases, uh, methods A, B, and C, um, a bit of on ATA spec 42, and then some about post-quantum world PKI for aircraft. I've included a slide of acronyms uh, because I know the slides are going to be available later through DEF CON. Um, but um, like I said, those of you who work in aerospace will know what I'm talking about. Um, I will try to name them out every time I mention them the first time around. Um, if I don't, just throw something at me. So why is it important? Well, in aviation, we have this thing called field loadable software or FLS. And in modern commercial aircraft, FLS is everywhere. And, and don't just think about your IFE, right? It, you know, it's um, like you're in flight entertainment, sorry, uh, with your films or movies. Um, we have sensors which generate logs for maintenance and preventive, preventative maintenance, communication systems, control surfaces, and navigation databases. And then for legacy and in most cases on next-gen aircraft, if you wanted to update the firmware um, in a, a line replaceable unit or an LRU, you'd have to take it out and put a new one in. <laughs> Whereas um, with the enabled aircraft, uh, there are certain LRUs to which you can just push new FLS to activate new features or just to update the, the functionality to fix any bugs. And if you saw my talk on uh, DEF CON 28 um, on the aircraft information systems domain, uh, you rem might remember my favorite factoid, and, and that's that there are about 1,400 different software parts on a 787 and two control the bathrooms. Um, so these are the typical use cases. It's not an exhaustive list. But it covers the main use cases um, in, in commercial aviation and those which I generally have time for today. So aircraft operators receive FLS from multiple sources. They can be manufacturers, OEMs, suppliers, and even from internal teams who can build a subtype, subtype of FLS called UMI, or User Modifiable Information. A good example of UMI is a configuration load for the aircraft information systems domain on certain aircraft, which will define things like connectivity to the ground, um, enabling and disabling features or systems. And that is a part we would create and sign before we can put it on the aircraft. And when we receive an FLS from an external source, we are required by regulation to verify its authenticity. For handling FLS, the manufacturers provide operators with the software to which we configure them with the verified supplier's trust chains. And that allows us to verify it's been signed by the trusted entity. As important as veri verifying its authenticity, it's vital we check the FLS integrity as well. And we're also required by regulation to do that as well. In fact, through various standards, we're mandated to do this before uploading to the aircraft. And there's a new requirement, and I'm sure I'm going to get some eye rolls from somebody in the front row here, uh, about the recent uh, implementation of, uh, or, or basically, uh, new rules around using ARINC 645-1 portable data loaders, or PDLs. Um, it's been a bit of a, bit of a thing for us, um, but these uh, uh, enforce signature checking of the FLS prior to loading onto the aircraft uh, for, in a technical sense. So we're not relying on the, on the mechanic or the technician to do those checks. You actually can't physically put it on the aircraft until that signature has been checked, which is great. And it may or may not surprise you when I say that a an aircraft can generate hundreds of megabytes, if not several gigabytes of data per flight leg. 
We've come a long way from the days of UI messages over ACARs, although they do still exist. Um, the vast majority of data comes from the engines. Or a certain aircraft, if you have a Navy pilot and he slams it on a landing, some air, you know, the carbon fiber aircraft, they also generate stress data. And as soon as the aircraft touches down, you get that infamous weight on wheel signal to the avionics, it will start trying to establish a link to the ground systems. And sometimes even before the aircraft reaches the gate. These connections are typically 4G and Wi-Fi. And most airport gates have an access point for a service called GateLink, which can best be described as a common use network dedicated for aircraft traffic. And for that reason, many operators also implement a VPN through GateLink to their network boundary. And depending on the aircraft, each VPN can require between one and three certificates just for that connection. And that's per aircraft. It's also worth noting the logs are digitally signed and verified before being ingested by the operator in the relevant tools or sent on to third parties for analysis. Certificates can also be used to enforce boundary, server, and even application authentication. It does require mapping these certificates to AD identities, which is fun, um, especially if you operate a large number of enabled aircraft. And uh, it's no secret that, you know, at United, we're trying to upgrade our fleet. Um, uh, I think when I started, we had 150 enabled aircraft in our fleet, uh, which was a minority. By the time we finished updating it, we'll have over 1,000 enabled aircraft. And that's going to mean a lot of work in terms of this uh, PKI and the connectivity piece. And the final use case I'd like to cover today touches a little bit on ETA Spec 42, which I'm going to cover a bit later on. But suffice to say, there are some real wins possible using certificates in smart cards for user authentication. Not only does it provide two-factor without a mobile device, but it has advantages from a user experience perspective as well. If you're in a public-facing role, would you rather a password with 15 plus characters, which is rotated every three to 12 months, or would you prefer a smart card with a, a PIN code instead. And every time you log in, you type in a PIN code, PIN code, and when you pull the smart card out, it locks the screen automatically. So you get great security, and you also get a great user experience as well. And if you're an, a gate agent working in a public area, that could be a real win. We're working on it. But going back to signing FLS, so ATA Spec 42 requires all PKI subscribers to authenticate uh, to the PKA management platform um, using those smart card-based hardware certificates, like I just showed you in my hand there. Um, the spec puts a huge emphasis on identity verification, dual controls, and audit of all activities. Without strong authentication mechanisms, all of that would be for naught. In some scenarios, and depending on the method used to sign the FLS, um, the signing certificate can be held on the smart card of those specific authorized, uh, sorry, those specific subscribers who are authorized to sign the software. So coming on to the signing then, so signing FLS method A. Um, on the left there, we're receiving the, um, receiving the software or it's coming from that internal team. Um, and in method A, it's typically, um, in this scenario, it's typically unsigned. If it was signed, it would just be verified and then put into the, into the storage um, or the repository. But in method A, um, you, you get your data, um, your, your software part here, which is an ARINX 665 load. Uh, basically, it's an ARINX standard of zip file structures and the header files. Um, and then using the uh, manufacturer provided tools, the device sponsor here um, will use their smart card and they will, um, the software will then verify that certificate on his smart card with an OCSP response. And if it's valid, the software will go ahead and sign that software using that device sponsor's private key. And it creates a load with a signed OCSP response along with the data and the encrypted hash or the signature. And this is great. It's got a bunch of advantages. So once an FLS has been signed with a valid certificate, 
it never needs to be signed again unless that software is modified. So it doesn't matter if that certificate is revoked later or it expires. We know that at the time of signing that that certificate was valid. Um, and also in this situation, the aircraft does not need to access a CRL or a certificate revocation list. It just needs to be configured with a trust chain. The disadvantages are you don't control the PKI and you have to pay for it. And also, you know, these ground system environments often use virtual machines. And, and if you can imagine here, I've oversimplified it here, but um, this device sponsor is probably on a, on a laptop going to a jump box to go into a high secure zone. And you've got to get that smart card that he's got on his laptop read by the software that's on a VM through a jump box. That can be tricky to set up. And I'm probably getting some nods in the front row. I can't see for the lights. <laughs> Uh, method B, a um, little bit more simplistic. Um, so we will receive data, uh, signed or unsigned. Um, if it's signed, we verify the signature and then strip it off. And then um, we keep our um, signing signature, or signing certificate, sorry, in a HSM, which is used by that software. Um, Checks on this, is checked by the CRL, of course, and then goes um, uh, a much more simple structure here and then goes into repository. From the repository, I didn't cover that in the last slide, sorry. There are multiple ways to get that from the repository to the aircraft. There is, there's the over the air technique, um, which some aircraft um, uh, 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 enable us to do. It still requires a, a mechanic or a technician to go um, into the cockpit and press some buttons. Um, and there's some other conditions which have to be true as well. So all this science fiction you read about changing software in flight. Yeah, I'm not gonna tell you what those conditions are, but um, there are conditions which stop that kind of thing. Um, we can also use USBs, and these are not your typical USBs you keep at home. Um, these are actually uh, assigned as tools, and they are treated as such. They're signed in and out of the tool store. They go through procedures to uh, wipe and clean them, um, or at least they should anyway. Uh, and then the, the one in the middle there is um, a PDL or a portable data loader. Um, that's what I was talking about earlier with there at 6451. Um, um, and um, they will connect to the network, pull the software onto the PDL, you walk to the aircraft and plug the PDL into the aircraft and do it that way. And then there's method C, uh, which is very similar to method A, but it also includes a signed SCDP response as well. Okay. Um, and as far as I'm aware, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I'm not aware of this method in use um, for commercial aircraft today. May well happen in the future, but today it's not currently in operation for commercial aircraft. Um, but it does have practical uses where FLS is designed to be kept for a long term. Because um, while I said earlier in method A, the FLS doesn't need to be re-signed, that's only as long as the CA it was issued for, from remains valid. Um, so that could be a few years or it could be 20 years, depending on when you've caught it in that cycle. Um, method C allows for really long-term FLS to remain valid with the least amount of disruption uh, to any aircraft FLS you've got loaded on there. It's also an inter interesting solution for rec record keeping in aircraft maintenance, where you have to keep documentation, sometimes for the lifespan of the aircraft and be able, and you have to be able to prove that it hasn't been modified during that time. Um, so this is a typical process flow for the generation of an aircraft certificate. It is not by all means the only way of doing it, but I'm pressed for time, so it's the only one I'm going to, I'm going to cover today. Um, so keying an aircraft is part of the maintenance function, uh, and this means procedures are in place to make sure it's done only when authorized, and there's adequate documentation and approvals in the process. So um, obviously your device sponsor here, um, or you know, somebody in, in your technical operations department, tech ops, uh, will generate the, the key instruction or the key generation uh, work instruction. And then someone would go to the aircraft and generate that key pair. Um, and then depending on whether you've got over the air or whether you've, you're using PDLs um, and USBs, you will bring that CSR um, back to the network, validate it, and then send it off to your PKI provider. Um, the RA function there, that's the registration authority. That's an interesting one. So this is um, an ATA spec 42 requirement and it, it's all about dual control. Um, ATA spec 42 
requires uh, the PKI to have this registration authority who proves all registrations and requests. And when an airline outsources their PKI operation to a third party, uh, there can be a need to insert an airline employee as the RA inside the PKI provider. Uh, and that's where this gets, stuff gets interesting. Um, and, and this is especially important for confirming aircraft identities um, because the PKI provider, they do PKI, they don't do aircraft, right? Um, not all the time, but um, uh, there is one. Um, and this, can, this creates a challenge when it comes to the, the audit side of the, of the PKI. And obviously that audit is a key part of spec 42. Um, but yes, yeah, so the RA will authenticate and approve the CSR. That then gets passed on to the certificate authority who will again validate the CSR information and then um, and the signature and then issue the certificate. And then um, your technician goes back, retrieves the certificate, <laughs> generates the work, loading work instruction, takes it to the aircraft, the aircraft validates the certificate and you know, Bob's your uncle. That's a typical process. And as you can see, one of the key things is that just like if you were generating um, you know, a key pair on a server, the private key stays on the aircraft. Spec 42. <laughs> so um, uh, the ATA eBusiness Data Security Working Group, or the DSWG, um, is, set, is to set the strategic path for these standards and ensure that all project team efforts and specification change requests are consistent with the industry's e-business vision, mission, and strategic plan. I couldn't paste that from their website. I, n I never sound that professional. Um, but basically, um, it, it's, a, it's a group uh, formed by experts across the industry, including OEMs, manufacturers, operators. Um, I'm in there. I feel very, um, I, I feel less intelligent than I usually do in that room because these guys have just brains the size of a planet, but it's important that we're there. Um, Suppliers are in the room and then interested parties from the ATA membership as well. And, and ATA Spec 42 has a strong emphasis on the establishment of trust based on verified identity. Um, so when you become a subscriber as a person, you go through identity checks uh, to verify that you are who you say you are. Um, and that then goes through two-person control as well. We also have um, strong emphasis on certificate usage, technical and procedural controls, protection of PII, uh, audit documents, um, it's 410 pages and it's very complex language. I'm going to be straight with you. The first time I read it, it was tough. I did not get it. It took me several reads and it also put me to sleep a few times. I'm not going to lie. Um, it's a good cure for insomnia. Um, but we were told that all PKI um, have to basically um, um, use to design software parts shall now be compliant with the ATS Spec 42. Um, so what that means is if we're using one certificate to sign parts, then we're just going to start using um, ATA Spec 42 compliant certificates for all of our PKI. Uh, so that's what we've been doing. Um, audit scope is defined by the network and technology used in operating the PKI. It's a bit like the fruit of the poison tree. So everything the PKI touches is in scope. So remember that RA role I was talking about earlier? Um, this is where it gets fun because the RA is considered part of the PKI but they use the operator's IT and network. Um, and so to avoid bringing that in the entire operator IT into a very painful and thorough audit, um, they need to use a very locked down IT device with, with you know, bare bones um, of, of what's required um, and you know, minimum of interaction with the network and the infrastructure. It's strictly controlled by the certificate policy and the certificate practice statement and forms a part of the on-site checks during the annual audit. So we've got a few of these um, in, you know, all over the country, actually, because a lot of us are remote and the auditor is going to have to go and fly and see them uh, and check they are locked down to the specifications in the CPS. So it's, it's fun. And then finally, um, so the challenges to aviation PKI in a post quantum world. Um, this one's been really, you know, eating away at my brain the last, um, you know, six to 12 months. Um, because the, the threats are not only very real, but also very difficult to figure out in terms of aviation. Um, depending on who you talk to, a uh, quantum computer capable of breaking Shaw's algorithm is either 5, 10, 15, or 20 years away. But regardless, uh, an aircraft lifespan is typically 30 years or even more. Um, and once an aircraft is certified, it's really hard to change it. It's certainly very expensive. 
Um, I mean, the rumor is it takes so much testing that changing one line of code in the avionics costs a million dollars just because you have to go through all those tests afterwards. Don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I've been told. Um, so imagine how, mu how much effort it would take to enable post-quantum key sizes across all manufacturers and all fleets. Does the hardware in the LIU have the required memory and processing power for PQ algorithms? The switch from SHA-1 to SHA-2 back in about 2017 um, caused a friend of mine in a previous job uh, to complain a lot about how it now took 10 minutes to create a, t a key pair instead of the five minutes that it used to. How long would a post-quantum safe signature take to generate in an LIU? I don't know. Um, that's that's going to be an interesting one to do. Um, so um, I'm, I'm coming to the end here and I want to talk about a little bit about the way ahead. Um, um, so at the operator level, um, some advice from the DSWG is to start invent an inventory of all your PKI use cases. Um, and when NIST finally figures out which algorithms we are good to use for which use case, um, start identifying those suitable algorithms for each one. And then with the manufacturers and OEMs, we're going to have to figure out the embedded software challenge because that's a big one. If you've, ever, if you've ever coded in C, dealing with memory pointers and the digital signature, which was, you know, a few dozen kilobytes is now several megabytes, um, that's going to be fun. Um, and of course, we need to do a lot of testing, regulator approval, and it's not going to happen in the timeline we've got for post-quantum computing to become a thing, but to become a threat. So we're up against it on that front. Um, I'm going to be back in the village after this talk. If anyone wants to come and talk about post-quantum PKI, I'm all ears. Um, I'd love to hear um, from any experts out there. I can take that back to the SWG and those, and maybe sound a little bit more intelligent than I usually do. Um, but uh, yeah, um, or if you just want to come back and talk PKI, I'll be there for a little bit. I've got Malort. I live in Chicago now, so I'm now I'm, I'm a, you know it's obligatory to become a Malort fan. So um, I've got Malort if you want that too. Uh, but yeah, I've got a few moments for questions. I think. Crack it! Light is bright. <laughs> Thank you. So, gentlemen at the front. Yeah. Um, it's it's hard to say yes to that. Um, uh, the the reason being is that um, it's not specifically covered in regulation. A lot of this isn't actually. Um, it's actually more to do with um, the manufacturers send down recommendations and instructions to operators on how to do things. And they also build things around a secure framework. Um, they all have product security teams and they all do a lot of work. They can't share a lot of information with us except for these recommendations and instructions, right? And the FAA has quite rightly said, even if it's a recommendation, you implement it as if it was an instruction, right? So that's, that's good and that's what we do. Um, so that... Um, signing of the logs coming off the aircraft, obviously, is, is probably a part of that risk assessment that the manufacturers have gone through because that is potentially safety related. If the logs are tampered with, then either um, a required, um, uh, you know, uh, maintenance check or job is not going to be done or it's going to be done and it's not required, right? Um, and that's a problem. So that's why they're signed. So when they come off and they're analyzed, we're sure of their integrity. Good question. Yes, sorry, blue jackets. Sorry, say that again. Um, with method A, um, you just grab a new certificate and carry on. With method B, uh, you get a new certificate and re-sign everything. <laughs> Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 When I say logs, I mean all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Folk was a part of that. Um, so for those who don't know, Focal data is, is engine related. And actually, we don't um, decode that. It goes to back to the engine manufacturers. They decode it. And they're really nice. They sell it back to us. Yeah, <laughs> as well, yeah.
All right. I think I'm being kicked off stage. Um, so like I said, I'm in the village. You want to come and chat um, and, you know, share some of the lot. Thanks.